A good one. Okay, awesome. How many of you guys? Uh, okay, what we're doing these next three weeks is we're 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 trying to lay foundations for what it means to be an apostolic people, and uh, what it, what it means to be an apostolic people. And our vision is real real simple is to be a biblical Christians and what we want to do is create um, an, an uh, apostolic equipping and sending center that that goes to the nations that can establish em- missional kingdom families that multiply and that bring the kingdom on earth so the, the prototype for that is in in the book of Acts and it's the Antioch church so um, you guys going to be comfortable standing you sure that's because you're, you know, buff and fit. Um, awesome. So what I mentioned is that in order for a people to be function apostolically, like as in the book of Acts, which, by the way, is possible today, do not kid yourself into thinking that we cannot replicate and experience the same kind of reality of the kingdom that was in the word of God. That is... Um, absolutely uh, ridiculous to think that, that that reality is outside of our reach. We can touch the fullness of what God's died for and his promise. So um, in order to be this kind of apostolic people, there, there's got to be three major things that happen. And again, I know I'm, I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit, but it's important that you get it. Um, there, the, the three brushstrokes are and you guys remind me, what's the first R? Revival. revival. And what does revival speak of? Yeah, it speaks of the manifested, the manifested presence and power of God. And so um, every great move of God, every great, um, you know, people that revealed Jesus and brought his kingdom to the earth, they all started as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit every time. Now, our roots, anybody that's touched the Holy Spirit in in the last, you know, 120 years, anybody that's ever encountered the person of the Holy Spirit at all or the gifts of the Spirit at all, they can tie their roots back to Azusa Street. The fastest, largest, most impactful segment of the body of Christ is the charismatic Pentecostal expression of evangelical Christianity by far and away anything that's been that's that's embraced cessationism that is just pure evangelical that won't embrace the Holy Spirit they're all either holding their ground or dying but globally worldwide in China in India in Africa in Europe in the states the fastest most influential group that is bringing the reality of God on earth is that wing of the church called charismatic Pentecostals that have the evangelical relationship with the Bible. In other words, they believe it's the word of God. Now, has there been goofiness, excesses, misrepresentation? Absolutely, of course. But, but, but without a doubt, the people that have embraced the reality, the outpointing of the Spirit, they're the ones shaken and bacon in the planet right now. Mm-hmm. And that started, that was initiated, well, actually, before even Azusa Street, it goes back into Topeka. A guy named Charles Parham. He was a white pastor that read the Bible and goes, we have, we have been ripped off. We have a, a false lens was put in front of us from the reformers that said the Holy Spirit of the gifts are not for today. And he said, I don't, I don't believe that anymore. He drew a circle around himself and he said, I'm not leaving until I get baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the power of God fell in Topeka, Kansas, and it was a shocko, shocker. This guy then went on the road and began mentoring other believers in the things of the Spirit, Charles Parham. And his number one disciple was William Seymour. William Seymour was a black son of a slave who was blind in one eye and looked like a street person. He really wasn't that educated. And Parham trained Seymour in the things of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Seymour gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, this lady heard about him, and she had a little church in L.A., and so she wires for him to come and be the pastor. She sends him the money. He travels on the train, 
he gets there, and on the second day, he teaches about the baptism of the Holy Spirit accompanied with tongues. <clears throat> accompanied with tongues. And uh, she was so offended by his teaching that she threw him out and locked him out of the building. So he was wandering around the streets, poor and rejected. And this guy felt sorry for him and pulled him into his house, and they began a prayer meeting. And it ended up becoming the most explosive sense of the manifested presence of God in the entire Western Hemisphere. And it was built, of, it was started by a black man, and it was, so it was interracial, and it was intergenerational. And the stories will make your hair cur curl, because people would walk into the cloud of the glory of God and get healed and get filled with the Spirit, and the eternal realm would touch them. And that launched every single denomination that embraces the Spirit, whether it's AG, Pentecostals, Church of God, all that, they came out of Azusa Street, and so did you. You just don't know it. And it was launched by a, a poor black man who put his head under a crate and prayed for the glory of God to come down. So it was started in a prayer meeting where people believed God for all the fullness of what he died for. So when we talk about revival, okay, we're not just talking about a couple of goosebumps. We're talking about being saturated in the unseen realm of God. And that means there's a current or a river of his living water flowing from within. Out of our innermost being come rivers multiple of living water. That's the inner outflowing of the Holy Spirit and fire. The Holy Spirit comes on us to be witnesses in power and give us the gifts. So revival is a way of life. A way of life in the presence of God. And I know, you know, I've, I've had seasons where I fought for a, a, a face time with Jesus. And I'm sure all of you are. But the number one thing we're going to fight for, the first thing we're going to fight for in everybody in our family is that we learn to get face time with Jesus unto the end that his spirit is flowing from him into you as a lifestyle. So if you're going to come into this family and make this your family, we will fight. You, you want to agree to being filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, and full of His life. Because if you resist that, then you're going at cross purposes with what this family's been mandated to do. We're mandated to release the reality of the Spirit of God onto people. And that you know that you're baptized and filled with the Spirit if there's a high degree of the fruit of the Spirit flowing out of you. Okay, let's repeat that. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. So if you have a high degree of the fruit of the Spirit flowing out of you, you know that's supernatural because nobody's that nice. <laughs> Nobody. And so when the Holy Spirit's moving through us, we're just a lot nicer. We are a lot more loving. We're a lot more patient. And it's like, wow, I'm being influenced by the indwelling Christ. And that's within reach for every person. And if that's not operative in your life, it can be. It can be. That's what Jesus died to do, is to come inside of you as the person of the Spirit and come on you in the power of the Holy Spirit and change your very disposition, your temperament. And so the fruit of the Spirit is, a, is the top most important indicator that you're being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. The second one is how much wisdom and revelation you operate in. Because our actions are determined by our thinking and by our knowing in our deepest knower. And so if we're flooded with wit the wisdom and revelation of the Spirit, we know things that, that come from heaven, and we therefore can know the will of God in order to do the will of God. So it's knowing not just His will, but it's also knowing His ways. Mm -hmm. So the wisdom is the objective truth written in the Scripture. The revelation is the subjective application of that, revel of that wisdom in our lives. So when you're filled with a spirit, the word of God comes alive. You, you just got to have more of the word. And the revelation of God comes alive, which rebuilds your very, it renews your mind and alters the neurological pathways of your brain so that you have actually a new thinker, a new way of conceiving reality is what we're after. Rather than perceiving reality the way the humanist will tell you, we want to perceive reality the way God tells us. And the third thing that happens is power comes flooding through your life. And you can, you can actually affect angels and affect demons and pray for the sick with effectiveness. So 
the filling of the Holy Spirit, the presence and power of God, which is what we call revival, that is what we want to be as a revival people. So what I will do from the, for the rest of my life, you can count on this, will not change. It hasn't changed for 40 years. It won't change for the next 40. In our work, from here to the end, we will fight for you to have face time with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Under the end that you become like him. Is that okay with you? You're going to sign up for that? Yeah. And we won't let up. And if your flesh starts squealing and, you're, and you start getting irritated and all this, we'll, we'll love you, but we're going to pray against the spirits that are seducing you away from that promise. And pray over your life and fight for you to become like Jesus in your lifetime. Now, how much like Jesus can we get? I don't know, but I know it's a lot more than I think. Mm -hmm. So let's be a corporate Jesus. Let's have the skin of Jesus in, in our generation. So revival is becoming like Jesus under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will identify with any and every group that is interested in doing that. That's why I like Bethel. They may not have a couple of the other elements, but they do have this one. They fight for the presence of the Lord. So whenever some group, you know, like a Heidi and Roland Baker, they fight for the presence of the Lord. Like Toronto, it was the vineyard up there in Toronto. The thing that launched Toronto and the whole vineyard was the, the, uh, the, the coming down of the Holy Spirit. That's what launched the vineyard, was an outpouring. That's what launched, by the way, Methodism. Mm -hmm. Is Charles Wesley got strangely heated up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then what did he do? He went around the country starting method groups, missional kingdom families. And that's where you get Methodism. Holy Spirit in small groups. Whoa, you mean we didn't invent that? <laughs> Maybe no, Jesus invented that. So you get my point. This is not new. Well, we're not, we're not trying to be different than the Bible. We're just trying to do biblical Christianity and, and stop reinventing another version of the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. So real biblical Christianity, the people of God are always infused by the person of the Holy Spirit. Always. There's no such thing as, you know, as a lukewarm, dead withdrawn, shut down, hard-hearted group of believers. If that's the case, we should, which it kind of is our case, we've got to fast, we want to pray, we want to repent our way back into intimacy. So, like, I've been contending for more face time with the Lord, to, because the Lord rebuked me. He said, you're skating on the level of the anointing you had when you brought the kingdom into the inner city. And he goes, and this place is harder. This is harder. I'm like, whoa, I never, I mean, I said that, but I didn't really believe it. He goes, no, it really is harder the, because rich people that, are, that have a pretty place, they don't need that much Jesus. And he goes, you've got to fight through the different versions of the Christian life that are seducing people away from fire. So go after this thing. And so this morning I woke up, literally, I was having an, a vision with the Lord. It was so intense, man. He was literally, I was walking with him and he had his arm around me. And he says, you're my friend. He told me, I'm your friend. Now, I was littler than him. I was like his little brother. But he was like, you're my friend and my, and my little brother. And I just want to be with you, Tim. I love you so much. And I can literally feel the presence of the Lord. And I woke up, and I was like, oh, my Lord, this is not that hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, normally it's like, oh, I feel embarrassed. I haven't been with him. And I feel guilty. And I struggle. And I fight. The Lord goes, what are you doing? I'm not, I am not a sin-conscious God that is going around thinking about what a creep you are. I really love you. I like you. And I just want to be with you. Stop, chill out. Be with me. And oh my gosh, don't make this harder than it is. And man, I just woke up and I've just been under him, his influence all morning. And that's what I mean by the presence of the Lord. And it, it, I'm not shaking and quaking and my eyes aren't rolling back in my head and anything like that. I'm Literally, there's times that my half, I'm not rolling back in the head, that would be a bad sign, too. but that would be a not a good sign, but, but let me tell you something, we can conduct the anointing and look very, just kind and, we don't have to be a fanatically weirdo a behaving people to conduct the Lord. So the sinners ought to really like us. Sinful, everyday, broken people ought to just fi find us because we're safe. And you know what? Um, one time I was in an elevator, and I'd just been with the Lord, and 
I, I honestly, I felt like a light was emitting off me. And um, this lady, this was, there was a couple of people in this thing, and they, they go, some, so a power, is, I literally said, a power is coming off of you. Would you mind if we stood closer to you? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, like, seriously. Our poet, somewhere in Kansas City, a couple weeks ago, he said to you, man, there's a light coming off yeah. of you. He's this black guy that lives in one of our houses, and he, go, you know, we just met him for the first time. He goes, "There's a light coming off you. What is this?" He goes, "There's an energy and a power and a and a life and a love coming off you." He goes, "He goes, I bet you know the Lord, right?" And I go, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> now again, that's for everybody. We all have a candlelight, so revival is that, and and can we contend for that for each other? That's why we we have twos and threes. It's to not let it. It's not just a visit about, you know, how we decorate our houses. Although that's okay. That's all kingdom. It's to really fight for one another to be fully alive in Jesus. That's what a DNA is about, and that's what an MKF is about. That's what we're trying to do here. It's just to stoke up and get the fire of God on down on our spirit, man, because American Christianity has seduced us. So I'm going to send you links to Bill Johnson. I'm going to teach you about Azusa Street. We're going to teach each other about these things. Right now, the number one thing I would like you to read is, is Secrets to the Secret Place. If you haven't read it, it's a book about how to meet with Jesus. And I know there's a hundred other books that can help you become awesome. But I'm trying to coach you. I really want you to trust that the, that the coaching we're going to do for you is right on the money. You have to have confidence in your life trainer. And you have to have confidence in your coach. If you don't have confidence in your leadership, then, then it's probably not a good place. But I'm telling you up front, I will always be on this page teaching you how to get fully alive. That's why inner healing, by the way. It's getting rid of the clutter that's jamming up intimacy with God and other people. That's all it is. Forgiving and getting the heart healed so we can live from our heart with the presence of God. Now, I know there's lots of other helps, but I'm, I'm trying to tell you, stick with what we're trying to do because it, there's a reason for it. And, um, okay, that's revival. Everybody get that part. <laughs> the presence of the Lord. How many of you think that's kind of important? Because you want to face the Lord at your death, and he goes, I did know you. <laughs> Not, I didn't know you. I did know you. We had eye contact. We knew each other. You heard my voice. You obeyed me. You don't want to get to the end of life. You're like, you know what? I was religious, but I didn't know you. Or I was, you know, whatever it is. I had ministry, but I never knew you. So, man, I'm, I'm accountable. If you're, if you're in this family, I'm accountable for your soul before God. Do you understand the seriousness of that on an elder? Like, I have to, like the Lord goes, listen, you can't let up. I have an accountability for your soul before God. So, don't get irritated if I do my job. Because <laughs> that is my job. Mm -hmm. Just like if you come to the gym and you say, hey, I'm going to pay you to get fit. Well, don't be irritated if I make you do push-ups mm -hmm. and stop eating as much carbohydrates that are full of sugar. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, don't let me. And that it's not going to just be me. I want you to learn to make disciples. I don't want you just looking to me. I am going to disciple you as you disciple others. I can't disciple a thousand people, but together we can disciple a thousand people. Because of the model that God's given us. But the number one thing you have to learn to do is to teach people how to get into the presence of the Lord. To see his face. If you cannot do that, if you've never helped somebody grow in intimacy with the Lord, now's the time to start. Do you understand? That's the first job you have, is helping them know Jesus. So that means you need to start doing that. But by the way, the, the way I grew the best was by helping somebody else Follow Jesus. Even when I didn't know him that well. So, all right. The second word is what? Restoration. Restoration. That's the one we're going to land on today. Restoration has to do with how well we come under the kingdom of God. It's seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, which is rightly relating. Okay, so the kingdom is all about government. I'm going to get to that in a minute. The third one has to do with what? What's the third word? transformation it means once we bring the kingdom within us 
and take this city. Once we bring the kingdom between us in divine order, we have the ability to bring the kingdom around us in the marketplace, in our neighborhoods, one person at a time. And you can actually be a part of transforming an area. Is that crazy? Now, not one person can, one person can help transform one person. A family can help form, transform a family. An MKF can transform a neighborhood. And an apostolic hub can transform a region and even a nation. You already have two nations asking for help. This little group. Two nations already asking for our help. So you got to get going here. All right. Now, we are going to work on this concept of, of uh, restoration. The restoration of the reformation of the church today. Tomorrow, next Sunday, I'm bringing Josh here. Josh Horick. I want him to come down, and I want, there's some things up inside of Josh Horick that there's some stuff up inside of him that needs to be unleashed on this group. He's a spiritual son of ours, and he is an amazing, he's the lead elder up in Laramie. And you need to understand that we're building trance locally as well as locally, and there's a symbiotic relationship we have down here with Laramie. And it's, it's a holy thing, what's going on. Laramie... What's that? Well, he's on Bloomington. Yeah. yeah. How many of you heard Josh share last time? Was it cool or what? Mm-hmm. It's amazing, wasn't it? So Josh is going to come and share some things that are going to, like, in my opinion, m- move you over into another realm of following Jesus. So, man, do not miss this. So this thing about restoration, really when you think about restoration, you want to think about kingdom government. Okay, can everybody just say the word kingdom government? (laughs) Okay, kingdom government. Now what we're going to do is we're going to read through these Bible verses that I printed off for you in your notes. And I want you to understand that kingdom government is a very, very central theme in Scripture. There's two major words in Scripture that you've got to understand. One is covenant, the other is kingdom. (coughs) And God built his kingdom relationally in covenant. In covenant relationships. So covenant and kingdom are inseparable. <laughs> now let's go through, and I'm going to have, we're going to just go around, I'm going to have David read the first verse, and, and then, you know, we'll get to, you know, however far we get. But just read it out loud, because we can pick it up on the tape. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay. What, the key word that I'm going for here is, what do you think is the key word I'm going after? Rule. rule. That is a huge word in the Bible. Rule. Or manage. Or lead. Or govern. All those things. Rule. The, the mandate to rule was in the initial purpose of, the, of creation itself for, uh, as humanity. Okay, next verse. Mark. Well done, my good servant. He said, for you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. So here's this notion that as we're faithful in the way we govern, in, in this space and time moment, we'll be proportionate to the responsibility we have in the, in the uh, millennial reign of Christ. How's that for a crazy thought? Faithful and little, you'll be promoted to, you'll be entrusted with more authority and responsibility in the age to come. Okay, next verse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will, they will need the light of the lamp, nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Okay. So they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. And they will live with the, in this emitting, this radiant light with God. And what is it that they're going to do forever and ever? Reign. reign. So does ruling and reigning seem like an important concept to God? In other words, we're going to be sons of God who are co-regents with him. And he is going to grant us delegated authority to take responsibility in his creation to bring his government to bear. 
into eternity. Like we're not going to be floating around on clouds with harps and just doing nothing. That sounds so kind of boring. We're literally going to govern with the Lord. There's a stewardship we have, a managerial stewardship. So, okay, next. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. So when we talk about restoration, the starting point is the governing of God on the inside. Mm -hmm. Getting a renewed mind, a transformed heart, and an altered lifestyle. So it's being kingdomized from within. Because why? Out of the heart are the issues of life. So when we were talking about, you know, this place looks so sanitary and so pretty, and what's the need for a radical group of apostolic people? You know, because aren't we doing well in northern Colorado? Because everything looks good, smells good, and we're, we have plumbing and sewers, and, and I'm so proud of David. He goes, absolutely not. Outwardly, we may look good. Inwardly, we are wicked, deceitful, and in deep, hellish trouble. And that's what God, that's what matters to the Lord in the first place. It's not, is there just, you know, poverty and trash and crime. All that is a fruit of a root issue, which is a wicked heart. So you've got to have a radical people that recognize that the war starts on the inside. And David was astute enough to be aware that, man, we're creating an army of love that is going to go after the human heart and renew the human mind. That's where the battle is. Now, just even in our street, we're meeting people, and they, they may look good, they may have nice homes and manicured yards, but I want to tell you, their lives are falling apart. Falling apart. And we do not need to offer them another, Christian, another version of the Christian religion. We need to introduce them to the authentic, real Jesus with a real family that's full of fire. So the kingdom of God starts within. It's a heart issue. We are not into sin management. You know, a lot of people say, well, we're the moral policemen, and we got to get everybody to stop, you know, drinking and stop having illicit sex, and that's our job as Christians. Just go out and fix everybody's bad behavior. It's like, pfft. Jesus never started outwardly. He always started inwardly with the human heart. And then the behavior will come into, into divine order. Is that cool? So that's why I, we just don't want to go around being, you know, you know, little prudish, you know, finger waggers. You evil person. You evil person. We have to love people from the heart where their daddy wounds really are and their mommy wounds really are. Okay, next verse. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, there you go. That's what we're after. That's our job as Christian. Every day we wake up on mission to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. Next verse. Ephesians 5, 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. Okay, now here's where it gets dicey. <laughs> here's where this whole kingdom thing starts getting troublesome. Submitting to Jesus as a theory sounds so great because he's perfect. He's so nice. And when it's just he and Jesus, I know that at least I can count on 50% of the equation being really cool and put together. All right, but now we've got a problem because the Lord is saying, okay, here's the deal. I am going to rule through delegated authority. I am going to set myself up inside the human heart. And what I want you to do is submit one to another as unto the Lord. In other words, submit to the Christ and each other. So now you have to deal with God through skin. And that's really where the test starts. That's really where this thing starts getting tough, isn't it? It's like if it's just me and you floating around on a cloud with Jesus, no big problem. But now I have to deal with dorky people, fallen people, strange people, people I may or may not like. And I have to now start hunting for the Christ inside of them. 
and submitting to the Christ inside of them. And when we see restoration, it's when the people of God come under the government of God through people. Now this is the tough stuff because it's been people that have hurt us. Like who trusts people ultimately? I don't trust people ultimately, but I have to trust that Christ through people is going to govern me. So now I have a problem. It's been people that have most damaged me, most betrayed me, most let me down, most hurt me. So I've created an inner vow and a wall to people, especially church people. Like, you think you've had problems. Well, try being a leader once. Try leading other churches one time. You know, you think you've had church, church wounds? You have no idea what a church wound happens until you get sheep bit and betrayed by sons. I mean, it's and lay your life down and watch things happen and splits go on. And I know you've touched it. I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I'm just saying I understand your pain. I understand people's pains. Got it? That, that does not, but so the, if, if a family messed you up, if a church family messed you up, guess what? Here's the problem. It's going to take a church family to unmess you up. Because God is not going to bypass skin. But oh, for you're an exception. You got especially hurt. So you don't have to mess around with people anymore. Uh, no, sorry, not true. In fact, this is where the pressure is going to come. Because nobody trusts authority. Nobody trusts the Christ in people. So now we've got to fight our way back into being a bona fide family where the real power is. And where the real pain can happen. So this is submit one to, one to another passage. is a huge passage. Because the culture of the government of God that will bring restoration is a culture of humility, submission, and honor. You honor the Christ in people. You submit to the Christ in people. You obey the Christ in people. Now, aren't these great words? We just love the words like submit. How many of you just love submit? <laughs> oh, I just love the word submit. Gee, I can't wait to submit to the Christ in, in David here. I just can't wait to obey David. Oh, that's what I want to do with my life is go around obeying people. of you think that that just doesn't that word just great on your flesh and it's probably because we've so used to being abused and manipulated by bad government that our default is to have no government and that's what the bible calls lawlessness so it says in the last days love's going to go cold and everybody's going to be lawless including the church so they create a, another version of the christian religion to avoid mutual submission government, obedience, and honor. And we live these independent lives doing life on our terms. How many of you know what I'm just talking about here? And if you don't know, I mean, you, you should feel this. This is painful to talk about because God's inviting us back into messing around with people. Now, how many of you got to choose your families? Like you chose your dad and mom. How many of you got to choose your, fa your families? You got to choose your siblings. Anybody got to choose? No. How many of you get to choose your spiritual families? No. You don't really. Not if you're playing by the rules of heaven. Mm -hmm. See, people shop. They are what we're shopping around and say, well, then you aren't even on the page. Because that's not how it works. You, you ask God, God, lead me to my peeps. Lead me to my peeps. Show me who's going to be government in my life. Show me who, because, and you know what? There's going to be an element about it that is going to be unattractive. And somebody says, well, you know, there's some people I meet in this, in this rock family. I already don't like them. <laughs> I said, well, do you like everybody in your family? <laughs> like, honestly, if you go to, have you been to one of your family reunions lately? Really? How many of you think it's a little rough to get through? Okay, you know? Yeah, of course. What if practical and legitimate things that you would say in your heart yep. outside of your theology? This is such an incredible, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this, but I would say it goes like this. Obviously, the backdrop is the Bible. Okay, the backdrop is the Bible. No one gets, us to, no one gets to ask us to do something that isn't in the Bible. And the spirit of it is, 
follow me as I follow the Lord. So here's the rules. In the, in the worldly government and even in the Christian religion, leadership operates by manipulation, control, coercion, even codependence, and a, and a mutual uh, contract. I'll give you something if you give me something back. Not in the kingdom. Government in the kingdom, and we're going to get back on this a little. The government in the kingdom is exactly the opposite. The goal is through, you, ha, you can't suck freedom out of the atmosphere. So the goal is only with the spirit of freedom does someone win our hearts by mercy, kindness, self-sacrifice, and um, self-denial and love. And by revealing Jesus to us, they say, follow me as I follow the Lord. Don't follow me, but follow the Lord in me. And you know if the Lord's in them by the level of their fruit, the level of their wisdom and revelation, and the level of the power that's in their life. You are not obligated to follow somebody that isn't following the Lord. Okay? Not this blind thing of this blind following is not in Scripture. So what does it look like? Practically, it looks like I'm hunting for the Jesus in you, Nicole. I'm looking for fruit, wisdom, and power. And I'm, I'm going to have to go through your soul and your personality. Because you're not always in a good mood, right? Nope. nope. <laughs> but I believe there's a treasure in an earth. I believe there's a treasure in your field. So the field is, a, the field is like, a, like the dirt part. And so how many of you know there, there's that treasure in, a treasure in an earthen vessel statement? Yeah. We're all treasures in an earthen vessel. So now I've got to get through the earthen vessel. It may be pretty. It may not be pretty. It may be... Whatever. I go through the earthen vessel and I get to the treasure, which is the Christ inside you and your true self in communion with him. And I can discern if it's Jesus because it matches the scripture and the heart of Christ. And when it does, I follow you. Now, this same, this same thing applies for marriage. So let's keep going. Let's, let's just, that's what we read about, this verse. Okay? Let me just comment on that. It says, husbands... You're, you're the head of the marriage. Wives submit to your husbands. Does that mean a wife has to do something her husband asks her that is not the will of, you know, is outside the will of God? If he says, honey, let's do something trashy and awful that's immoral, is she obligated to comply with that? Is she ob 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 obligated to submit to abuse? No. Only as this, she goes... As this husband manifests Christ, the wife comes under him as he manifests the leadership of Jesus in her life. Then husbands, it says, love your wives. So in the kingdom, your authority, your responsibility and authority are proportionate. And the one with the least, uh, with the most responsibility has the least privilege. That's kind of how you know as well. It's like this person's laying their lives down. If they're not laying their lives down, and they're, get, and they're getting something out of you illegally, that's not, you don't have to follow that. So am I answering the question? Yeah. Okay, we're going to keep going. That, that is the brilliant, that's the question of the hour, really, what you asked. So I can leave it to Nicole. All right, let's go to the next verse. Okay, do you hear a conversation about government here? Mm -hmm. Okay, children are to honor their parents, submit to their leadership, and it's and it's a and it's a it's a command with a promise attached to it. But it says, dads, you've got to illustrate Jesus to your kids, mm -hmm. instruct them, and reveal Jesus to them. Okay, all of this is about the restoring of divine order relationally. Are you catching this? Mm -hmm. And bringing the government of God within our heart lives, and between us in both natural and spiritual family. So remember, God's a father and a son. He builds his kingdom relationally in family, natural and spiritual. And in order to get the greatest amount of love into that group, he brings government. That's the role of delegated authority. I'm going to repeat this again. The role of delegated authority 
is to initiate covenant love, sustain and protect covenant love, and to extend covenant love by having new babies or having new children in the spirit. So the role of government is always about initiating, protecting, preserving the heart of God in that group. That's why he delegates authority. How, how many of you think that's a good thing? It should be a beautiful... In other words, we should be... We should Every time we pray, thy kingdom come on earth, we're praying for the government of God. Every time. All right, so let's keep going. Next verse. Okay, now this is a description of being governed in the marketplace. And we're going to comment on that later. So there's five jurisdictions of God's government revealed in Scripture. You've heard me talk about this, but we're going to get it again. Here they are. Personal government under Christ. You will give an account for your personal life outside of anybody else's government. You can't blame shift. You're accountable before God for your life. You can't blame someone else if you're in a bad mood or you're sinning. That's important. We're not victims walking around here. We're personally responsible. Second is the natural family, marriage and family and kids. That's the second phase of government. Third is the church, elders, deacons, apostles, prophets, so forth. The fourth is the marketplace, your bosses. And the fifth is civil government, police, elected officials, whatever. Okay. And, God, and the Bible has something to say about every one of those five jurisdictions and how we're to respond and relate to these people. Interesting, huh? Okay, next verse. Okay, notice that word rule. Again, it's never, Jesus said, you don't rule by coming over people and manipulating, telling them what to do. It's, it's rule from a kingdom vantage point. But the ability to become an elder is based upon your ability to manage your family. If you can't manage your own household, the Bible says, you can't come and bring management and rule to the church. So rule, in other words, leadership and management are the criterion for eldership. How's that? Does that make sense? Is it a good thing to aspire for the men to aspire to be elders? Absolutely. Why is that a good thing? Yeah. Correct. And we want those kind of guys, right? Anybody else want to add to that? Why do we want why do we want you guys to be elders? Yeah, Rich? Oh man, we've taught them to love. We've taught them to obey God. And is that hard work? Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard work. You're fighting against flesh and devils and culture. It's hard work to raise kids. Spiritual kids and natural kids, is it not? Yeah, okay. So we want people to be competent in parenting. Man, that's good. We want women to be awesome spiritual moms. Yes. That's it. Absolutely. That's why we're spending so much time laying foundations in this new church plant. And not just assuming that everybody's on the same page because we're coming in from different versions of the Christian religion or from the kingdom. And we have to start again and go, this is what we're about. And, and honestly, Jesus said, make disciples and teach them to obey. So a disciple is somebody who obeys Jesus. And, an, and an, the role of a leader is to help them learn how to obey. 
It's to teach them how to obey. And from the heart. It's one thing to be, you know, just external conformity. And it's another one to internalize the values and own them for themselves so that when no one's looking, they're still doing it. You know, I travel a lot. I go to a lot of other cities. And normally I do that, though, with partnership because I don't want to submit myself to any unnecessary temptation. Like we took, you know, Mono and I went to Burma. We go, we travel in twos. I do not believe in lonely itinerant ministry travel because these guys get in hotel rooms and they do naughty things. But I tell you what, that still doesn't mean that when I'm in other places, I couldn't just go off the deep end. What, what's the assurance of that? One, I live in the light. I live holy before the Lord. I fight to live in purity. I don't want to use it as a ticket to go on, you know, to go on some, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I don't want that kind of testimony in my life before the Lord. I want to walk in the fear of the Lord. You have a wife and a kid, I'm sure. Yes, and I have a wife and a kid. <laughs> but man, that's what we want. We want a family full of purity and full of holiness. We want to transfer that to our kids. I just, I just reprint, published a letter from a daughter who wrote about the impact that pornography had on her as a woman. As a young girl, she discovered pornography on her dad's computer and what it did to her. And it's, it like just rips me up, man. And I just, I'm just like, it's so rampant. And I'm like, no, not in our guys. Come on, not in our gals. We can do better than this. Mm -hmm. And we will do better than this. Mm -hmm. But I'm aware it's a battle. It's a battle 85% of us fight and, and lose a lot. So we're going to fight for this. Nobody should feel guilty. It's just, but we're going to recover biblical Christianity and biblical sexuality. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. And it's going to, by the way, it's a lot more fun when we do. <laughs> All right, next verse. Yeah. Do you hear this? It's a Paul's appeal to to come underneath the governance of civil authority and have a proper attitude about it. Next verse. All right, so um, th this is talk about church leadership now. It's talking about elders. And it is saying, hey, look, this guy is trying to fight. He should be trying to fight for your wholeness, for your transformation to Christ's likeness, for you to get the fullness of the kingdom in your life. Don't make their job hard. Don't be resistant, independent, self-appointed. Don't just figure out how to get in unity with that leader and and let's get to where we're going without a whole lot of resistance. That's my appeal for me, <laughs> personally. Um, but that's my appeal for the church. Up, it's harder for a person to say that because it sounds like it's on their own behalf. I didn't sign up. I, mean, I don't get anything out of this except the joy of helping. So it's really not for me. It's for you. And, and when I get to Laramie, I appeal for this for the elders up there. And I appeal for this in other places, too. Uh, so you get the point. You know, it'd be fun if a parent should say, hey, look, I really want to be, I want you to, you know, Jamie, your parents are saying, I want you to be awesome, Jamie. Try not to make our life miserable. You know? That's bottom line. I mean, we really are in this for you. And so let's work together here, can we? You know? and, and if one of your siblings is being a peanut, then go challenge them. Okay, next verse. <laughs> Next verse. Submit yourselves, therefore, for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Okay. Well, I mean, this is a sampling of all the, re of the references to government. You can see every one of those five jurisdictions is mentioned here, right? Mm -hmm. So turn to the next page. I 
I want to, I, I, it looks like we haven't covered this, but we have covered a lot of it, so we're going to move right through it. Number one, kingdom restorations will occur when we voluntarily, this is a key word, allow Christ to be our king within our spirits, souls, and bodies, and in all of our relationships. Does that, does that point make sense to you? In other words, you're going to be as whole and fully alive as you are submitted to establish government. That's where the work is going to be. It's submission, honor, obedience, all that stuff. Those changes into Christ's likeness, the word in the Bible is repentance. That's why when Jesus preached, he says his first word was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You repent your way into the reality of the kingdom. Can just everybody say the word repent? It is a great awesome word. How many of you think you repent once maybe a year? No. If you are a follower of Christ, you are repenting as a lifestyle. I am repenting all day, every day. If I'm outside the government of God, like if I'm not submitting to the Christ of my wife and I'm hurting her heart, I have to, I can't just sit there and buck up and keep insisting on doing it. In rebellion, in my way, I have to repent my way back into her heart and back into favor with God. Repentance is a way of life. The group that knows how to repent and hit the deck will attract the favor of God. Repentance should be one of your favorite words. I think it's good to say, I'm wrong. It's just, I'm wrong. That was a bad thought. That was not a right thought. That thought stunk. It was not helpful. It was toxic. That was bad behavior. That was not right. It's a bad attitude. It's good to be honest and not a victim and not, you know, and not like justifying and rationalizing sin. Just suck it up. Wrongness does not get you rejected in this house. In fact, it gets you honored. They say, well, I got to preserve my, my rightness or you'll think less of me. No, we won't. We know you're wrong. <laughs> you're not helping your cause by defending yourself. You're flat, dead wrong. Bad attitude, bad behavior, bad thinking. Well, but if you find that out and really believe it, then, then you I'll, no. We think everybody is wrong sometime today. So just suck it up, own it, admit it, and repent, which means change. Change. And don't, don't, don't um, verbalize it and then not do anything about it. Because if you... If you're saying repent, but you're, but you're patronizing us, and it's just you're verbalizing it, but you don't mean it, oh, we'll find out. You mean when you say, I'm sorry. If, there that's you not go. Re repenting. That's not repenting. <laughs> and even sorry is not really a good word. No. It's really, I seek forgiveness because I sinned. Or I had one say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really a great apology. <laughs> In other words, you're all wrong, but I'm sorry you're wrong. Oh, never mind. You get it. It's, it's let's repent really quickly. The, the less defensive we are, the better. But it's insecure people that get defensive because they think that that admittance of wrong will get you less loved. Oh, that's not true. So I just assume everybody stinks. We all stink. And we're all wrong. We all have issues. We all have problems. So let's not act like we're anything more than people trying to get become like Jesus. And we've got more of our lives left to be changed than we are like Jesus. How many of you think that? Let's, let's be generous and say we're all about 10% like Christ. That leaves 90% to repent. Let's just all agree that we have 90% transformation. I can go with that. That'd be generous, by the way. But let's say we're 10% like Christ, we got 90% to go. That's a lot of repenting. How many of you think that? That's the way we should stay there. Stay there from here to the end. So repent. Now, um, we all choose who will rule us. Your choice, you choose who will rule us. The world imposes rule. But in the end, we all choose who will rule us. It might be ourselves, it might be money or power, manipulative people, lust or carnal nature, religion, 
but you will choose who governs you. And remember Bob Dylan's song that we should sing. Okay, Mark, how does it go? Keep going. It might be the devil, or it might be the Lord, but you don't have to say that about my I want you to sing it. You gotta serve somebody. That's how it's doing. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you gotta serve somebody. And you know I, that song went just went crazy because it, it was like that's revelation. You are gonna serve somebody. It might be you. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. Of course, if it's you, then ultimately it's the devil. There's really only two servants, two gods. One is the God of this world, little g, and then there's the real God. You might as well kick it with the real God. True? Yes. Yay. All right. So the word, the word kingdom is a government term, and it means the dominion of the king, the rule of the king. So um, let's go to point two. Christ extends his government onto the earth, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, which is always consistent with the Word of God. You got that? The Word of God is our objective plumb line. Mm -hmm. And it was written by the Holy Spirit, so they are in agreement. All right? Now, he governs through the Spirit, so that we're led by the Spirit, that's the Son of God, and he delegates his authority within the five spheres of human government, which we already mentioned. So everything, including God's model for government, flows from the Trinity. This is a very important thought. I want you to grab it with me now. It's going to be, work with me here, just a second. Each of the three persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are equally God. Is that true? Yes. All right. And I have a whole teaching on the Trinity in the discipleship training, if you want to go to it. Um, so, yet, the Son is subordinate in role to the Father. Do you guys understand that? The Son revealed and did the bidding of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is subordinate in role to the Son. Now follow the thinking. So the government of God is totally different than worldly government. God highly values freedom because it is essential for valid love and worship. Therefore, God rules through love, self-sacrifice, servanthood, mercy, and kindness. All of God's subjects or sons must voluntarily yield to his rule worldly government obtains power through domination manipulation fear control coercion greed self-serving contracts humanistic mercy which creates codependence entitlement and irresponsibility i like that last phrase mm -hmm. humanistic mercy unsanctified mercy which manipulate which uh, creates codependence or entitlement, or irresponsibility. The role of all government is to help you become more responsible, not less responsible. That's why in our compassion ministries, we will take responsibility to interview people. We might give them initial help, but in due time, we're going to ask them about their financial decisions, their budget, the use of their time, because we will not give money just, just randomly. That's why I'm going to ask all of you, direct your tithe to the eldership which will be, and the deacons. Do not take it upon yourself to be the deacons and decide who and when you'll give money to. Now, I do know there's time for gifts. There's time for a spirit-led gift, but don't count that as your tithe. We've got to coordinate compassion, and we'll get a team of people that will coordinate. Now, I know good things have been given. Cars have been given. Some money's been given. I'm not trying to confront that or stop that, okay? There's times for spontaneous spirit-led compassion with the family. All right, but in general, the way we want to operate as a family is through the wisdom of God to where we're, we're dispensing that money with excellence and we're tithing in and we're submitting to the eldership so that they can bring the government of God to that money. That is, see, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to tithe by deciding. I'm going to take government over my tithe. You do not do that. I don't take government over my tithe. We take we, we submit that to the government of God. Does that make sense? All right, so um, the kingdom of God, point C, is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. Now track with me here. Each person in the kingdom, just like the Trinity, has equal value 
is equally loved, has equal access to the Father through Jesus Christ. However, each person is not equal in role, responsibility, or authority. Let's pause. I want some questions. That's a big mouthful. Do you see the difference between being equal of value but subordinate in role? How many of you see that? Does that offend you? Correct. This is a tough one. This is a tough one because here's what we need to understand, okay? God himself delegates authority. And you can see there's a difference between man-appointed authority that comes from a vote and true godly authority that comes from the character of the person, their, their, their operating wisdom, and the sacrifice of their life. <laughs> so when you meet someone with true authority... They feel like Jesus. They have your heart and your life in mind. And they, they remember, they, the person with a, their authority comes from the responsibility that they've accepted. And they're laying their lives down for you. And they have been given that authority from heaven, not from you, not from your vote. See, see, Jamie didn't get to vote for her dad. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, God appointed Oma and Kim to be her government in the natural family that this is not a democracy the kids didn't all together they can't vote dad off the island (laughs) as much as that might be tempting now and then they don't get to do that he is the father assigned by heaven now they have to they have to learn how to honor him when he's being dishonorable now that's a whole nother topic how do you honor somebody that's dishonorable how do you honor your father and mother when they're being dishonorable how do you honor a leader when he's being dishonorable and there is a point of Matthew 18 appeal to a leader, which we'll get into. You don't have to just sit around and be victimized by an oppressive leader. That is unbiblical. Okay, there are, there are ways, procedures that you follow to confront somebody that isn't leading according to Christ. Is that good news? You don't have to just accept some, you know, dictator. Dictatorship is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a very broken, benevolent, humble person that is called to help facilitate your your transformation into Christ's likeness and your destiny on earth. Now, will they make mistakes? Yeah, and will they have humanity? Yes, just like you do in your, your families. But remember, true authority has been given by God to people. Political authority has been voted by man and has been held by charm, coercion, deal cutting or manipulation or a political procedure. And so when the church drifted over into institutionalism, it became how can I campaign and politic to get voted into that position? So you have people, it's power by political process, not power that came from delegated authority from God. Are you following following what I'm saying? And if people can put you in power, people can take you out of power. So what you have to discern is, is this person operating in true spiritual authority? That's, that's the question. And, but you know what, honestly? It's not that hard to, to figure out if you really look at it. I mean, honestly, you can, you can, at this point, we're fairly sophisticated people. We know the Bible and you can pick up if somebody's got your best interest in mind. But this, this idea of true authority is something you want to understand because you all want to grow in your, in your authority, in your, in your responsibility and authority before God. But we're not all equal in this room. And so God will raise up elders that will have, there will be a plurality of elders and there will be first among equals. At this point, it would be me. But at some point, that that person might not be me. 
Okay, it doesn't mean it's always going to be me, but th what we will know by virtue of this person, deep love and humility and father heart. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'm the point elder, and we'll find out over time who's really elding. <laughs> and if they're really elding, then we'll all kind of know, like, oh, my gosh, that guy was really elding. He, he taught me how to get into the presence of God. He fought for my life. He was there at my inner healing, my inner healing. They worked with me in my marriage. They, they fought for me. They, they elded. And so we're looking for real elders, not voted elders, because they can run a good business. Because <laughs> you know, they have money and influence. No. It's, it's how much character do they bear on their spirit man? How well do they love? So that's what we're going for, right? Now, let's keep, we're almost there. We'll keep going here. Um, God builds his kingdom relationally through covenant love expressed in natural spiritual family. The purpose of government is to extend God's protection, provision, love, wisdom, and power to others. Delegated authority acts on God's behalf to initiate covenant love, preserve it, protect it, and extend it. Does that make sense? Okay, now let me give you an example. Mike Murphy. Mike Murphy's growing in his manhood. He's growing in his sense of responsibility. He goes to this woman named Nicole, and he says, I'd like to initiate a covenant. He initiated the covenant because that's his responsibility, not her. Now, she could have wanted it and suggested that she would be open to it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And encouraged and, and, and persuaded and kind of made her case. But, at the, but she really was, in a way, very vulnerable. She's called, because of that, the weaker sex. Has nothing to do with strength physically or intelligence or personality or capacity. You're actually the superior gender because you were made last. And God created in order from rocks to animals to... You got it. So we're just above the plant life. And then you guys, it went way beyond us. It's positionally, positionally in terms of role, the woman is asked to be equal of value, equal of access to God. There's neither male nor female. She has full access to Jesus as a son of God, okay, completely. She can influence from her radiance, but positionally in marriage, she's subordinate in role and must wait for the initiation of a man. So my goes, Nicole, were you on one knee? Oh, yeah. Nicole, shake it like <laughs> as we should, as we should, because who's, are we dying, you know, when you, government is all about dying, huh? Yeah. Now, he's going to die for her, and then she's going to take her, and take his last name, so, which is a symbol of dying. It's a symbol of dying to myself. So, Mike says, I'm going to initiate covenant. He does it. She says yes. She reciprocates in her initiation. Now, the woman in divine order is the very word for woman is paraclete, one who comes alongside. Same word for the Holy Spirit. She is God. She's the one that complements and extends that which is on the man. So he impregnates, but she carries the baby and has it. I'd say that's a pretty serious deal. So, subordination of role does not mean less importance. Let's be really clear about that. So when men have gotten carnal, they use that biblical passage if inappropriately and incorrectly to dominate women and abuse them and exploit them. That is so evil. That is not government in the kingdom. No way. And if we see any of that operating around here, we will call it out, man. None of that business. I mean, this is a woman submit, you know. I'm the boss. I'm the head. It's like, oh, gosh. You have just done antichrist government. So Mike initiated covenant. She responds. Now we have a legal entity before God called the Murphy family. Now they are, she's co-regent with him. He's the head. He's the tiebreaker. But if he's smart, he's going to submit to the Christ and her. True? Mm -hmm. Now they're going to walk in unity. So much so that really good government, it, it doesn't have to assert itself and put it out its chest and require submission. 
If you get to that point, you've pretty well lost. That's not cool government. You, you probably better go back to the drawing board and find out why, you know, why we have a problem in River City. Because probably you're, you're not all that worthy of following. And that, that's, that's the humility part of this. So now, he, his job is now to preserve that covenant with her. That means he's got to repent the fastest. Mm -hmm. He's got to seek forgiveness the quickest. He's got to be the most humble. He has got to bring more Jesus to her than, you know, he's got to, he's got to really be in his game. And he's got to protect her heart. And so he, he might be right and be wrong. Does that ever happen, Mike, where you were right but, but yet wrong? Because he was right in the argument, but with the way he was right was wrong. And, and Nicole goes, uh, throws the flag. On the, in, the game of, in the game of marriage life. And she goes, hey, uh -uh, Mike. Okay, point taken, flag thrown. What? What? She goes, foul, personal foul. Like, why? I was right. She goes, you were right, but you were wrong. Because you're, you're, you weren't bringing the government of Jesus in the way you just did this. You were pushy, boisterous, demanding, insensitive. Should I keep going? <laughs> I'm, unra I'm unwrapping this. No, I'm only I'm only painting the picture because we all have done this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't see those webcams up. So, so Mike's job though is to learn how to be a, in good government and steward the heart and the culture and the atmosphere of the marriage. And it's not just what are we going to do directionally. It's the vibe of heaven is in the home. It's atmosphere. It's culture. These are all the roles of a leader. The roles of a leader brings the core values to, to the house. They bring the vision to the house. They bring the culture, <coughs> the atmosphere of heaven to the house. And they bring the strategies of bringing the kingdom to the house. That's good leadership. So in this place, in this family, my assignment is to help you, and particularly, I just want to say, particularly men, why? Because we have, we, have a, a, we have to bring the government of God to our homes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fight for the men to learn how to be like Jesus to their families. Mm -hmm. So that in five years from now, in ten years from now, the wives go, woohoo, join the rock because we, we, we know how to have great marriages. Well, I don't, it's not about joining the rock. I mean, it's about coming into the, come into the family mm -hmm. and get your marriage improved. Come into the family because our men know how to govern. Now, do, do women have government? Of course they have government. Anytime you have responsibility, you have authority when it comes from heaven. So we want women to be awesome. There's no, there's no really ceiling on women in terms of how much influence they can have. True government is all about influence. And I'd say Heidi Baker has, carries a whole lot of government. As a woman of God, there's a lot of women in church history that, oh my gosh, they are the most amazing people. So, yeah. Well, even you and Nicole in the flag are great examples. I mean, isn't that right? You both Perfect. have the same sort of flag of saying, hey, follow us this way, this way, this yeah, way. That, that is, you have a voice. Mm -hmm. So, women that don't feel they have a voice, they start nagging or talking louder, mm -hmm. or they go on strike. And that's that we don't want that in our family. We don't want a, a group of women feeling powerless. We want a group of women feeling completely heard. The voice of Jesus coming through. Now, if you're if you're trying to communicate not the voice of Jesus, don't expect us to rise up and do what you say. But that's true for a man. That's not, it's not just a gender issue. So, how many of you understand that if we can bring right government internally, so you have to get under the government of Jesus with your minds thinking the right things, your heart's in the right place, your lifestyle is in divine order, your finances are in, under Jesus, his kingly rule, your time, your energy, your relationships are under Christ. That's your job personally, to come under Christ. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to bring your families, your marriages or your whatever, your families into the kingdom of God. And Jamie can help kingdomize the Gilbreth family. Mm -hmm. You have power in that family. You have a voice.
But then the third one is to bring the government of God between us. And if we can operate in good government, we can help each other get into restoration. I will be whole and you will be whole to the degree that you're under the right government of God. Submitting to it. And so we want to bring the government of God at work. So we're going to find out on the DNAs and in MKF, how's it going at work? Ah, my boss sucks. Well, now hold on. Is that the best way to talk about your boss? Have you been praying about them? Praying for them? Is there anything in your attitude that you can do? So we want to bring the kingdom where we work. Yes? Isn't that in the Bible? All right. So point F. Authority is proportionate to responsibility. Did you hear me? A lot of people want authority and no responsibility. That's dangerous. The higher the responsibility, the greater the authority. However, in the kingdom, those with most authority have the least privilege. This is because of the great sacrifices those in authority must make in order to represent God's heart to people under their leadership. So don't make it hard on them. Work with them because they're trying to work with you. Restoration will occur to the degree that we come under Christ's kingly rule and learn to submit to and obey those who Christ has delegated governmental authority in our lives. So here's some questions. Are you personally relating to Jesus Christ as your king? Or is he just a nice optional person? Second question. Does Christ own you? That's a big question because it's the Bible says he does. <laughs> Do you have you let him own you? Because he even though he does own you, he wants you to voluntarily let him own you. Does he own your money? Does he own your car? I remember one time thinking, okay, I think he owns my car. I think he owns my house. He does not own my fishing pole because I will not let anybody use my fishing pole. <laughs> And the Lord made me lend my fishing pole out, and sure enough, it got broke. <laughs> he made me lend my fishing pole because I held on to that thing, and I, and, I, and I had to repent. Now, it did get broke because God was testing my heart. He goes, but I wanted you to lend that pole. So do you think I like you to go fishing? Yes. Do you think that I'm in, the next thing I know, I'm getting this incredible pole given to me? He says, I'm just working with your heart, buddy. I want you to know there's a thousand fishing poles where that came from. It's, it was possessing you. You weren't possessing it. God likes us to have money. I like to have money. I think you would like to have money. Do you like having money? But it's not your money. God goes, do you not understand there's a lot of money? So why are, you, why are we so, oh, clutchy, clutchy? Because it has us rather than we have it. And God goes, I want the money back. And then I will, let me work with you. And that's where the supernatural stuff starts popping up. We figured out, and this is a little personal, but this home we got is super miracle. Out, out of the inner city, living in a convent. Okay, we, are you with me? And we land in this place, and we now own 50% 50, 50 of this home is already paid for. And there's $150,000 of equity in this home in four years. I don't know. You think Jesus is like, in our lives, there's no way to explain it but miracles. And I, I just really want us to welcome this, this world of Jesus is king and he owns us. That's where the fun starts. Is all your time, money, energy, talents, relationships under his governance? Who has both responsibility and governmental authority in your marriage and in your natural family? How well do you submit to, honor, and obey their leadership? Now, we have women that want to, in our family that want to get married. They've been married before. You know what I, I'm going to do when I get a chance to be with them? I'm going to say, how was your previous marriage as it relates to submission? Do you carry bitterness in your heart? What, where, did the, the, where did it go wrong? Let's repent. You, you will recycle in the same error if you don't deal with this. Don't be jumping back into a relationship if, if you haven't gone to the root of the problem. Are you tracking with me? Um, how well do you, uh, okay, who has responsibility and authority government in your church family? 
Now that's really the, a big question I'm looking for this month. Um, because we're starting a church family. Now I'm under government too, and I'll explain that in a minute. I'm under government. But the question is, is I, have an, a, a, I can't do my job without permission. So what happens is in most churches is the leader is optional. Because it's a come and go, dibble dabble way of relating. And you don't get down the road spiritually or buff in anything, not in a team, not in a job, not in physical health, unless there's a commitment. You don't get anywhere without commitment. How many of you understand what I just said? If every, and so you don't have a really good marriage. And if, 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 if Tom looks at Greg and says, you're optional, and there's back doors all over my heart, and, well, first of all, yeah, I guess the brass knuckles come out. <laughs> oh, how, what does that do to the human heart? Let me tell you something. Is the human heart made for white hot? Is the human heart made for covenant? Well, this idea that we're walking around in contractual relationships, that if you do me wrong, that I can do you wrong, and I can get out whenever I want, and this, this, this kind of optional, people are optional. That is not how it should flow. The human heart is built for covenant. It's built to connect and commit and go for it. That's where you get the big wins physically. In fact, you don't even gain muscle mass unless you commit to that resistance training. And does that make sense? You never get anywhere without committing to something to the point where it hurts. Where the cross, you pick up the cross. And so all I'm looking for here, the reason I wanted to get real deliberate before we transition to the next year, because I want to hit the ground running next year. I want us to start moving into what we're called to be. And there was just too much ambiguity, and that was my fault as a leader. Because I, I, I misdiscerned mis how many people came to the discipleship training, and we didn't have a conversation. And I said, this isn't good. we got too many people bringing their stuff to bear on us. i got to call all of us into commitment. And so there's a decision that somebody makes. Like, okay, I now get the vision of the house. It's to bring the kingdom to this region and to the nations. It's to establish multiplying missional kingdom families. I get this vision. It's to be an apostolic equipping center. You're going to train us in the marketplace and marriage and family. And we even have a university we're raising up. That's pretty cool. That's accredited. So we're going to be an equipping center that goes to the nations. And we're going to reach internationals. Okay, that's pretty cool. And we're going to try to affect the marketplace. Now I know their values. It's the glory of God. It's the rule of Christ. It's the kingdom. It's the father and the family. It's the great commission. Okay, I got those values. They're right in the word. What about culture? Affection. Safety. Love. Inner healing. Transparency. Fun. Earthy. You know, normal, natural, free. That's our culture. And yet, and then some. And what's our strategy? Okay, Susan 3, MKF, which is, all this is biblical. We have some basic general strategies. Could we have a lot of other things that we're going to do that we haven't thought about yet and have different? Of course. God will give us creativity. But for the general stuff, that's not going to change because it's biblical. Every time in human history people have done this thing, it's worked. What, is the, what are the three basic emphases to get there? You've got to have revival. You've got to be in his presence. You've got to be a people of presence. Mm -hmm. A people of power in the spirit. What else? You've got a people that are re being restored under the rule of Christ in good government. Because as goes our government, so goes the quality of our life. Bad government leads to chaos, anarchy, oppression, and every kind of creepy sin. Good government leads to peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If we're going to get in rest restoration, we've got to understand kingdom government, starting with our own governance, our relational governance, because government brings order. Government brings life. Government is the wineskin that conducts that wine we talked about. We want the wine of God, the Holy Spirit, but we want that wine to be flowing through the conduit of right government. How many of you understand what I just said? Which is family. And thirdly, we want transformation. So I, I, we want to see the culture change. So I got Mike Murphy, you know, I gave him some DVDs on, you know, 
uh, I think Fiji and and the one the Aleutian Island the uh, not the uh, the Inuk Indians but some of these transformation videos are are visual aids for you to believe that God can use a people to change it to change an area and we're going to start learning how to bring transformation one person at a time so we don't get too freaked out okay <laughs> it was like wow Tim you're talking about changing culture and yeah yeah but let's learn how to bring transformation to one person inner healing deliverance get them saved we're going to learn to neighbor so that's what we're doing and what we're asking for you th this month is pray and fast now i know some of you have already made that decision and we can sense that current of heaven but when you get into into unity with a group of people which by the way you won't like everybody everybody won't have great chemistry right away but what you got to do is fight through their treasure and get to jesus in them you might not even be the best palsy wowsy over time, but you have to learn how to at least connect with the Christ in them, even though you may not fully dig them. And over the years, personally, a family will attract people that are emotionally very unintelligent. In other words, there's a high dork factor. Maybe, I, maybe that's their leader. I don't know. Maybe that's me. But I have been the spiritual dad to people that are very broken, and, and very obnoxious and bizarre. And, but you know what? Over time, they got more healthy and more healthy and more healthy because people loved them and told them the truth and stood with them and didn't reject them. And there are people that you, I could tell stories that will blow your mind over the last 20 years that came into a family and just, they just got loved and accepted even in their weirdness. So not everybody that wanders in here is going to be the cool people, pretty people. We're all going to have strangeness on us. So if we if we are kind and loving, again, it doesn't mean you're best friends and you hang out forever. It's going to, but you got to love them if they're called to this family. The other thing is, somebody's asked, being in this family, does that mean I don't have friends outside of the rock side? And it's like, of course not. We, I have lots of friends. Well, I don't have lots of friends. Maybe maybe my <laughs> wife is my... No, we have friends outside of our church family. Of course we do. And we want to relate to other churches and other movements, which I do all the time. And I want to bring the best of the best into us. In our tribal gatherings, we'll always cross-pollinate. So we're not exclusive. We're not a cult. We're not weird. We're well-governed. Okay, in terms of our government, how does it work real quick? And then I know we got to go. We, we are built on an apostolic model of government. So we have an apostolic leadership team with prophetic people and apostolic people. And I'm a part of that. Mono's a part of that. Josh is a part of that. Ray De La Cruz is a part of that. Brett and Michelle Costigan, Norman Marcy Willis, John Cava. We have an apostolic team that is in government over this translocal work. Every one of our local churches... Has, will, ha, is developing an eldership team that's plural, a plurality of elders with one being the point leader. All of those eldership teams have a support and accountability team outside of the local church that looks in on their work. It's called a support and accountability team, SNA. And in our apostolic leadership team, we're now forming a support and accountability team even over our apostolic leadership team. So, no, in other words, no, but everybody gets local government and the benefit of translocal government looking in on them. Actually, more than that. Like Laramie has not only a leader eldership team, but a support and accountability team that, that gazes in on them and their economics, whatever. And then they have a translocal leadership team that if they get into real trouble, we can come in and help sort it out. So there's multiple levels of accountability all the way through our tribe. There's never one man, one rule. It's always plurality. And in the case of our government and our economics, our economics is open to the family. It's open economic reporting to, to the members of the family. We don't like just publish in the newspaper or anything. If somebody comes in from outside, what's your money? It's like, that's none of your business. But in terms of our family, it's anybody's business. So um, the rock, like next month, we're flying in.
this translocal apostolic prophetic leadership team. They'll be meeting right here in this living room, and it'll be people from Kirkland, Washington, El Paso, Kansas City, um, you know, Laramie, Cheyenne, well, yeah, Cheyenne. And so we'll have that group of people will be looking in on our budget, our Rock International budget. The primary role of Rock International is to facilitate our missions mandate to go to the nations. And so I'm even praying about, and I want you to pray about this idea, to call everybody in the Rock tribe in all these locations. This is a crazy idea. I wanted to test it on you. To, if, if, to give blood once a month and use the money that they give for missions. That's just an idea. Not, not everybody can look at a needle and do that, but that's just an idea. It won't be like that, but you can give six times a month for missions. Okay. Wow, thank you, Mr. Nurse. So uh, in, terms of our, in, terms of our, in terms of our journey, right now... Um, I'm functioning as the lead elder. We don't have another elder yet, but that's, that's in the works to have more than two and three or four elders. And then we'll have a deaconing team that will handle our compassion ministry to support. So there'll be multiple accountability. We're forming our budget for, for Rock All Nations right now. 20% of what gets tithed goes straight to missions through Rock International. And it ends up serving, it's going to go to help plant churches in Italy and Burma and Asia and, and Nepal at this point. So we are definitely a, a missions movement. What we want to be is a, a tribe on a mission, family with a mission. You know, everybody heard of YWAM, Youth with a Mission? Okay, it's a great organization, one of the biggest missions organizations in the world. But it's a short-term mission trip to expose young people to the nations. We want to expose young people to the nations, but as a tribe, so it's an ongoing lifestyle of missions. You don't just do it for five, six months, and then, boop, the, and then you enter into the American dream and lose Jesus. We want, to have, we want everybody to understand in our tribe that you are sending and being sent all at the same time. That's really an important concept. Everyone in this Antioch Apostolic Equipping Center is sending out and being sent all at the same time. So we're a missions church. Now we, I have not been taking any income personally at all from this, from the tithe at this point. We probably will discuss some, the possibility of helping pay some of our electric bills because we are living on about now three grand and then we just went to four grand a month, which is not gonna cut it in Fort Collins. <laughs> Might cut it in the inner city convent it's already paid for it, but it's not going to cut it here. So we're, we're really going to pray about that, but I've not wanted to touch it because I wanted to build a base of economics for whatever the Lord calls us to. But 20% of what's come in has gone to, is gone to missions. Now, we did start with Sue. Sue is getting a whopping $200 a month from Rock All Nations. And um, this is exciting because Rock International is putting in 200 and All Nations University is putting in 100. So Sue, to help me do all this administration stuff, is making about 500 a month. That's it. And she is available all the time. The girl's working in the middle of the night and up in the morning, and she's just, she's awesome. I need her help. We need her help to websites and communication. Eventually, I'm going to pray for a prayer hub that could be like an Azusa Street prayer hub where we can pray and saturate the region in intercession and train the market and pray marriage and marketplace. So that's we're going to pray for that. Um, but so any questions on this? On on who we are? Do you understand? Like, do you feel in your spirit that excitement from the Lord on this? Like to get in on the first time? I don't know if you can hear. <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you still there? Absolutely. Oh, my yeah. Lord. You got any questions, Anthony? A time. A time. <laughs> Good. That makes sense. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Anthony, do you hear what I'm doing? I'm laying foundations for a church plant. Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm recording some and taking notes. 
Okay, cool. Do you guys, have you ever been a part of establishing what I would call an apostolic equipping and sending center? It's very different than a local church, even a mega church. It's very different. Have any of you have ever been a part of one of these? Well, Jana has, you have, <laughs> Oma has, and that was up in Alaska, right? Mexico. Oh, in Mexico. And Mark, you were with uh, Team Life. Yeah, Larry People of Tom, Destiny. Larry Tomczak. Larry Tomczak, who was an incredible person. So this is a very biblical model. The tribal model is a biblical model for doing church planting and doing, doing life together. But it hasn't been done for a long time. And God's recovering this type of governance. Does that excite you? I mean, I'd like a few comments. Like, how's this hitting your hearts? Starting with some of the guys, because the girls tend to be more quick to verbalize. They're more verbal processors. I want to hear a couple of guys. How does this hit your heart? Uh, Rich. Well, it does. <laughs> I say I'm excited. Take it back on it again because I look at the context of what I'm doing, what we're doing uh -huh. in the context of what we were pursuing when I met Terry and Ryan and Terry and myself when we were pursuing this. Uh -huh. Is looking for the window and not yeah. heading to the primary and looking going first to the churches in the district and saying, okay, you know, we're talking to them, turn it on. What's got to happen? Because right. this one can't stop. And so we keep looking. And keep yeah. Looking. <laughs> if it if it doesn't produce a little sweat on your upper lip, a little nervousness, you probably haven't heard the gospel of the kingdom. Because it's pick up your cross, follow me. It's be like get, it's kind of like it, it feels like getting married, kind of to Jesus and each other unto the end of bringing the kingdom on earth. Oh, so, I just like oh man, when I got married, this is really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so I I feel that. Jen and I feel that. And it, it's, not, it's not an easy thing because you kind of lose your life. I'm, I'm on call. My, our lives are being connected to your lives. It doesn't mean we don't get some boundaries in there so we can go on a date. and We try to take Mondays off to just soak and be in the Lord because we work hard six days a week, early morning to late at night. But there's times we go up to Laramie on Monday nights for the, for the leadership gathering up there. And so we're, we're a part of that Laramie group quite deeply. But what's going on here is really big from the Lord. I, I hope you're catching it. What are you thinking, Oma? Put you on the spot. Makes me want to cry. Uh, just to honor Mono and Lori, they moved here for this. And I just love them. And they lost a ton of money selling the home in the hood. We thought we were going to make the base in King City. Then there might be, it might reemerge as another base, but this is the one God told us to, and it's really strange how we got here, but. They lost a lot of money to get here and to restart their homestead. And uh, you want to chime in on this at all? Sure. Yeah, c can you come over here so I can get you on the... Yeah. <clears throat> because we, we really we come here with the blank page, I, I think it's very important, you know, like we talk about submission. And if we, if we were honest, we'd say like pretty much all of us, oh yeah, we're, we're submitted to authority. Well, you won't really know until you're tested. That means you 100% disagree, and yet you will trust. You will trust God, and you will trust God through the leadership, through Kim. So I think it's uh, because we didn't come into a, a vacuum, a blank of we've never been uh, not hurt by all kinds of different leadership. It's very. I think it's 
it would be very beneficial to have this uh, hard look at where you come from as far as governance and you know what does that trigger in your heart mm-hmm. you know because right now it's teaching it's all good we, t- we hear truth we say amen when you're going to hundred percent disagree what are you going to do okay <laughs> you will you will be tested on submission it's good to know truth and say amen and so you have to walk and apply it and pull the juice the power of that what was just described so <clears throat> if you have previous pain or um, you come with like our heart just uh, it has a tendency to when there's bad bad governance we want to change the mode God established theocracy. Uh, bef- that was before the kings, right? So Eli, do you remember that? Eli, and he had two sons that were really bad. They were doing all kinds of bad things. And then Samuel came and said, Eli, you're, you know, you're trying to fall off. Samuel now has two sons, and he's about to pass away. And the people come, and they say, your sons are really bad. You know, they mess around with the women who come to sacrifice at the temple. They steal, they do all. And so we want a king. And this is like, this is, so you are confronted with bad governance and you want to change the mode of governance Mm -hmm. or go to no government. Mm -hmm. That's that's the tendency of our heart. Mm -hmm. And and God says like, to Samuel, he says like, it's not even you, it's the women. Mm -hmm. And so, and they were, the, the people, they were complaining about the two sons because Samuel was going to go away and they were so, I mean, they were going to lose them. And, but it was a heart issue. And so I think the one of the conversations that we need to have or you need to have with yourself in the Lord is uh, where do I stand on this issue? How does this, how does this hit me? Submit is like, it's not when you agree. If you're not submitting, you agree, you're already going. It's when you totally disagree. And you still submit. And then you trust God can take him to the whooping shed and have a word or two with him. And there's, <laughs> so what, what I would, uh, I know it's a little heavy to finish, but I, I know people didn't come with a blank sheet on the issue of, of church governance and how you were handled. And so those words, they trigger things, and uh, you may be completely, feel completely covered, open to theocracy. And I know in our culture, it's it's almost a scary word. I almost, like, look in your heart and your emotions right now when I say theocracy. How did it hit you? And that will be a good telltale of conversation? Do I need to have a conversation with God? So, yeah. <clears throat> as far as the, 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 their practical issue, like the question of Nicole, their practical ways of governance and submission and mutual submission and there's ways of appeal and so I, I think it would be really healthy to, um, to examine those sheets that you came with take a look and blank yeah. if it's all good Excellent. then great so I think one of the uh, that's huge mm-hmm. one of the things that I want to commit myself to is to be easily entreated I, I think someone that is not gentle is defensive and can't be easily entreated I think that's bad government so one of the things I want to do is make it easy to be challenged mm-hmm. easy to be confronted and there's a system and a process of where if, if, so, if I'm doing something or our elders are doing something that's, that's not helping, you can come straight to us, and then there's a process of Matthew 18. that you, There's people you can call to bring in if we're not easily entreated and we're not repenting and changing. So you're not just left vulnerable, one man, one, one rule. There's a, there's a large process that we can go through to hold unity. 
But uh, Mono's brought government to our lives. He's challenged us. We've adjusted based on things God brought to us through him. So anyway, I wanted to close this right now. And, and um, I'm excited because I know that when I've come under government, that's when the staff, when I started make, taking real ground in my life. When I caught that concept. And that's the restoration we're talking about. It's recovering kingdom governance in our lives. That is a good word. That's not a bad word. That's a good word. That's, this is the doorway to liberty. And it, out of chaos, out of a lack of discipline, it's committing ourselves together to come under the government of Jesus. Now, you can't have authority until you're under authority. So let's all learn how to come under authority so that we can upgrade the level of our delegated authority from God. God needs people that can bring us government through men and women onto the planet because he's not going to bypass him. Does that make sense? So what we want to do is see the government of God come to the region through his sons and daughters. So this is not just about you dealing with me or you dealing with elders. This is about you growing in your ability to govern. But you can't do that until you come under government. Does that make sense? You can't have authority unless you're on authority. That's true in the military and it's true in, in the kingdom. So let's stand. And uh, oh, yeah, you want to kick it off? <laughs>